Hi, it's Bruce Williams again, and I'm pleased to bring you the second installment on the gross pathology of the lymph node, and today we'll talk about lymphadenitis. As always, I'll start my lecture by thanking my colleagues who have provided the images that allow me to put these small lectures together. I'm going to start with this slide as a cautionary tale seeing that this is a nude mouse and it has huge lymph nodes underneath its neck 99 times out of a hundred you would say that this is lymphoma but in this particular case in a leaky nude mouse with more lymphocytes than it probably should have this turned out to be severe reactive hyperplasia so the cautionary tale is that Although we look at lymph nodes grossly, if you really want to know what's going on in any lymph node, you need to section it and look at it under the microscope. So let's talk briefly about a very common cause of lymphadenomegaly or enlarged lymph nodes, and that is normal reactive hyperplasia in response to antigenic stimulation. This is a great example of a reactive lymph node which was taken from the mesentery of a goat with severe coccidiosis. It was enlarged, the capsule was taut, and when it was incised, the inside of the lymph node bulged outwards from the surface. There might even be a little bit of fluid. Things I want you to notice is that the color is diffuse throughout. We don't have any evidence of hemorrhage or severe congestion. In inflamed nodes you will often see that the medulla is a dark red color because the lymph nodes are congested and dilated and most of your blood vessels are within the medullary sinuses. You can see that there is a cellular proliferation around the outside, probably the cortex. If you're really, really good and better than I am, you're going to see that these are germinal centers. But these coalescing areas, a little bit lower in the T-zone, maybe hyperplastic T-cells. I prefer at this point simply say it's a reactive node. If I really want to demonstrate the architecture, I can do that easily under the microscope. Antigenic stimulation is not the only way to get reactive lymph nodes. This is the intestine, mesentery, stomach, and colon from a cinnamalgus macaque which had been previously infected with simian immunodeficiency virus or simian lentiviruses. And the lentiviruses all act the same way because they have a tropism for T cells the early stages of infection are characterized by marked hyperplasia of the lymphoid organs, a tremendous stimulation of T cells, and that works in the virus's favor because those are cells that it infects and it can get a, get a great foothold in this animal. We see this not only with simian lentivirus, but all of the lentiviruses that affect animal species, like human immunodeficiency virus, feline immunodeficiency virus, bovine immunodeficiency virus. And initially you will see marked hyperplasia of the lymphoid organs. Lymph nodes will become very large and then over time the T cell counts will crash. The lymph nodes will atrophy. But in the early stages of disease look for hyperplastic, markedly hyperplastic nodes. If you noted that the enlarged hyperplastic node was very bland in terms of color, when we begin to deal with acute lymphadenitis, you will see that there are other changes in the nodes. And there is a color change because you will often see blood as a result of severe congestion, sometimes hemorrhage in acutely infected nodes. Remember that the nodes are not only the place where 
cells are exposed to antigen, but because of draining lymphatics, it often brings inflammatory cells directly to the node, where they can set up shop and cause infection. Cases of acute laminite, uh, lymphadenitis, will, the nodes will be enlarged, they will bulge on cut surface, they often, as seen here, will leak edema fluid because a major component of the acute inflammatory response is not as much cellular as it is vascular with tremendous outpouring of fluid. And if the animal is still alive, acutely inflamed nodes are often hot and painful. This particular node is from a cow with rinderpest. Here's another great example of acute lymphadenitis. The node is enlarged. There is a lot of red here, which may represent not only hemorrhage from the vessels within the node, but also draining hemorrhage. You can imagine how it bulged on cut section and there is a lot of fluid leakage. This is from a water buffalo infected with hemorrhagic septicemia or pasteurella multocida type B, a primary pasteurellosis in water buffalo and cattle that has an extremely high mortality. As in other cases of virulent pasteurellosis, this particular agent has an extremely potent endotoxin which does widespread damage to vessels. You can see these little beads of hemorrhage in the outer cortex, which are probably the direct effect of exotoxin on vessels, making this a hemorrhagic lymphadenitis as well. One of the characteristics of virulent pasteurella in any animal species is hemorrhages throughout the body, and this lymph node is no exception. And here is one more example of acute lymphadenitis from Derek Reed from Texas A&M, which shows a normal bovine lymph node on the right, and a lymph node that was taken from the area of the mammary gland. This is a supramammary lymph node in an animal with acute staphylococcal mastitis. If you compare the two, you can see that there is a tremendous cellular proliferation because prior to the acute lymphadenitis, this lymph node was probably bombarded with new antigens from that inflamed quarter of the udder. And at this point, we can see hemorrhage on one side. Is it draining? Is it originating in the lymph node? Well, it seems to be primarily focused on the subcapsular sinus, which is where afferent lymph comes in. So this may be an area of draining hemorrhage. All in all, an excellent example by comparison of the changes that you'll see in acute lymphadenitis. Now, not every acutely inflamed lymph node is going to be extremely obvious. Here's a very large mesenteric lymph node, which would qualify as acute lymphadenitis, but there's not a lot of fluid exudation when you cut into it. There may be some hemorrhage in there. It's tough to tell. And this is a macaque that was infected by a potent gram-negative called Francisella tularensis. And the key to these hot gram-negatives is they go after the lymphoid tissue of the gut, especially in the ileum, as well as the mesenteric lymph nodes and spleen. So when you cut this acutely inflamed lymph node in half, you may get a lot of necrosis and not the cellular responses that we've seen in the previous three examples. But it is acute. These animals usually die within several days. 
but this would be an acute necrotizing mesenteric lymphadenitis. Another form of acute lymphadenitis would be acute suppurative lymphadenitis caused by some very classic pyogenic organisms. Strep is an excellent example of one. And we're looking at the cervical lymph nodes of a guinea pig, which have been infected with Streptococcus equi variant zoepidemicus. The name of this disease is cervical lymphadenitis because adult animals often will contain the infection to the submandibular lymph nodes. This very potent bacteria has the ability to become inoculated through punctures by rough feed in the mouth. It is adapted for life in guinea pigs and horses and often travels down to the draining lymph nodes, the cervical and retropharyngeal lymph nodes where it sets up shop and quickly results in these liquid abscesses. It can even penetrate the intact mucous membrane in some cases. Adult animals generally confine the abscesses to these lymph nodes where they become extremely big and pus filled and the lay name for this condition is lumps. Younger animals, often it will break, break free and develop septicemia and so you will see a life-threatening infection with the agent in the lungs, pericardial sac, in the heart muscle itself, meninges, and in the peritoneum. We all know the guinea pigs are just small horses, so look at a almost identical disease in the horse called strangles, and we have a massively enlarged colonic lymph node which has been incised in this wonderful picture by Dr. Ingeborg Langor, and we can see that the pus has spilled out, almost identical to what we just looked at, and the story is, is the same in the horse. It's a very potent pyogenic bacteria that can cross intact mucous membranes of the oral cavity, or when it's scarified into the mucosa by rough feed, often goes directly to the submandibular and retropharyngeal lymph nodes. And about 20% of those cases in the horse will become systemic, causing a disease known as bastard strangles. And you can see infections not only in and around the head, but if this pus is swallowed, can get into the mesenteric lymph nodes, setting up these large intra-abdominal abscesses. This would be an acute suppurative lymphadenitis. Well, if we have an acute suppurative lymphadenitis, then we probably should have a chronic suppurative lymphadenitis. And there is an excellent example in small ruminants in diseases which are caused by Carinobacterium pseudotuberculosis. The name of the disease is caseous lymphadenitis. In goats, the pus that is caused by this organism within the lymph nodes tends to be sort of soft and pasty, and it is better fixed before you cut it if you want a nice photo. However, in goats, it tends to stratify much better, giving you this classic onion ringing appearance. And the way this happens is that the body is unable to clear this very potent gram-positive organism. So when it becomes inoculated into a lymph node, it will form pus. And then the body will respond by encasing that pus, this organism that it cannot overcome, by a ring of fibrous connective tissue, effectively walling it off. But this particular agent is going to hang around, it's going to produce more toxins, and eventually it is going to bust through that fibrous wall and infect the tissue around it, and then the body is going to respond with another fibrous wall, and then it will break through that fibrous wall, and then there will be another fibrous wall, and eventually you get this lovely laminated appearance. Well, 
when the disease is systemic, the nodes can get so large that this progressive growth of the bronchial and hilar lymph nodes can af actually cause asphyxiation over time. Coronibacterium pseudotuberculosis usually starts as a skin infection with small chronic abscesses within the skin. The problem is that when the sheep are sheared, these abscesses are often incised as part of that process and begin to drain. And once the sheep are done with the shearing, they all go into the dip tank for parasites. They all use the same dip tank, and this, in this way, the pus from one sheep can affect the whole flock because all of them, after shearing, have little cuts on their skin because shearing is not the most gentle of practices, and they will become infected. About 20% of these infections will become systemic and you'll have these internal lymph nodes that we've just looked at, which cause major problems, which cause weight loss in the affected animals, and what is known as the thin U syndrome. So that's the story of Carinobacterium pseudotuberculosis. The next step in the hardy bacterium story are those higher bacteria that have protective mechanisms that make them resistant to digestion by neutrophils, as well as macrophages. And they're very difficult to get out of the body. And if a bacterium can survive in a macrophage, eventually it will be carried by the macrophages to a lymph node in the body where it will set up shop and we will develop granulomatous lymphadenitis. This comes in both focal and diffuse forms. And in focal forms, such as this prescapular lymph node from an ox, where we can see multiple granulomas, the body is able to sort of wall this off temporarily and form a distinct granuloma with a central area of necrosis surrounded by epithelioid macrophages, which often are filled with the offending bacteria, Around the outside of this, there will be a layer of lymphocytes who are directing the granuloma formation and fibrous connective tissue. This is a case of actinobacillus in the scapular lymph node. We think about actinobacillus lignorisi as causing wooden tongue, and it often does, but sometimes you have occult lymphatic infections where the tongue is not affected, but it gets into the draining lymph nodes and you have granulomous inflammation of the retropharyngeal submandibular, and in this case, the prescapular lymph node. The body's doing a pretty good job walling it off. It's going to be a long-term infection, however. A classic cause of granulomous lymphadenitis and an agent that has the ability to cause either focal or diffuse granulomous lymphadenitis, depending on whether it generates the Th1 or the Th2 reaction, is mycobacterium. This is a classic picture of a granulomous lymphadenitis caused by mycobacterium bovis. Note the yellowish color, which is very characteristic of M. bovis infections, regardless of what tissue is infected. Whoever found this note is pretty lucky because in infected animals, clinical signs are rare and most positive cattle only have one lesion. Lung lesions are present in only 10 to 20 percent of cattle with gross lesions and usually affect the caudal lobes if you are going to find it there. Every once in a while or once in a great while, you'll come across a cow with disseminated lesions, which largely means that one of these infected pulmonary lesions has ruptured and has spilled the bacteria into the bloodstream. And then you might find lesions in multiple nodes, but it is not something which disseminates widely or easily. Sometimes lesions in the lung or the lymph nodes may resemble abscesses. So be careful of that as well. Not every abscess is a true abscess. 
the key to Mycobacterium bovis's success in the face of an active Th1 cell-mediated response is the protected lipid-rich cell walls that it has, which have the ability to inhibit phagosome lysosome fusion in macrophages and allow the organism to live within macrophages. It also has the ability to inhibit the formation of free radicals, which macrophages would use normally to kill phagocytized bacteria, and also causes a decrease in cytokine production from infected macrophages. We have done a pretty good job in eradicating mycobacteriosis, or at least tuberculosis, in cattle in the U.S. However, because white-tailed deer are endemic carriers in the northeastern United States, it may be very difficult to, to eradicate it completely. Mycobacterium bovis is also a common finding in exotic hoofstock and elephants in zoos, especially long-lived ones, and there's not a lot that we can do about that except to contain it. If you live in continental Europe, you may come in contact with Mycobacterium capri, which acts very similar in goats, but has also been identified in cattle, pigs, and deer. In certain countries, it represents up to 10% of all isolates in cases of tuberculosis in ruminants. You will hear two terms used when referring to mycobacteria in animals and humans, tuberculosis and mycobacteriosis. They are not interchangeable. The use of the term tuberculosis refers fairly specifically to infection by mycobacterium tuberculosis in humans and primates and mycobacterium bovis in ruminants and other susceptible species. These particular agents generate a significant Th1 response and a characteristic caseous granulomas. Mycobacterium bovis also has very few bacteria in the lesions, as does Mycobacterium tuberculosis. On the other hand, Many mycobacterial species, which used to collectively be called the Mycobacterium avium intracellulare complex, generate more of a Th2, or a suppressive macrophage response. So you get tremendous numbers of bacteria and a granulomatous condition in which you get large numbers of macrophages that are generally not walled off and collectively these are referred to as mycobacteriosis rather than tuberculosis. Here is a great case of mycobacteriosis in a cat. We don't generally think of, of cats getting mycobacterium avium, but they do. And if we incise this lymph node, and look at under the microscope, we will see that a large infiltrate of macrophages has infiltrated and effaced the lymph node without forming any discrete circular granulomas. And this is very characteristic of all of the many types of mycobacteria that are in the mycobacterium avium complex. In most cases, Mycobacterium avian across species tends to be ingested. Because Mycobacterium is everywhere we touch, we eat it on a regular basis every day. Usually when we see disseminated Mycobacteriosis in animal species, the individual has some form of defective immune response. These particular agents are very common infections in animals with immunodeficiency, such as patients with, uh, with human immunodeficiency virus, 
primates with simian immunodeficiency virus. So it often goes hand in hand with immunodeficiency. Mycobacterium avium used to be a very common infection in swine. We don't see it much anymore. Here is one in a lymph node, which is causing a sort of focal granulomatous lymphadenitis and marked reactive hyperplasia. Because it's primarily ingested, we often see very profound uh, granulomatous mesenteric lymphadenitis. And once again, if you were into, into, to incise this, you would see huge numbers of macrophages with large numbers of acid fast organisms as the body not only doesn't control it well, but because of the immunosuppressive effect of the Th2 response, doesn't really bother to try to. Similar condition is seen with Mycobacterium avium variant paratuberculosis or Yoni's disease in cattle. So a good way to approach Mycobacterium is to lump the M. tuberculosis and Bovis together and the very different condition that we see with M. avium in a separate category of mycobacteriosis. Here's a lymph node from a horse with a condition that was reported fairly commonly in the 1990s. We don't see it so much anymore as chronic granulomatous enteritis. This was a draining lymph node. And in some universities, about 50% of these cases were forms of Mycobacterium avium. So it affects a wide range of animal species and probably there is no particular species immune to its effect. Now bacteria are not the only things that will cause a granulomatous lymphadenitis, although we think of them as the, the most common cause. It's a great picture from Dr. David Dremeyer from South America showing bilaterally swollen inguinal lymph nodes in a pig. When sectioned, this would be a diffuse granulomatous lymphadenitis. Here are mesic lymph nodes also from a pig, probably not the same pig. And this is a condition that is caused by the virus, porcine circa virus type 2. Now, why would a virus cause granulomatous inflammation? Well, it goes back to the basic tenet that the virus is, has evolved to do exactly what is best for its survival and replication. And porcine circa virus type 2 preferentially infects macrophages. So what's the best thing that you can do if you live in macrophages? Cause an uncontrolled proliferation of them. So granulomatous lymphadenitis, you want to think about certain bacteria in pigs, which would include Mycobacterium avium, of course, which can give you a very similar uh, appearance, or even something like Actinobacillus suis, which characteristically causes granulomatous inflammation. But don't sleep on porcine circovirus type 2. Another beautiful picture of the mesenteric lymph nodes, swollen, hard, granulomatous inflammation due to porcine circovirus. It's not just the mesenteric lymph nodes. Any lymph node can be affected in affected pigs. It's not the only virus that will cause granulomatous inflammation in its best interest. This is a cat lymph node with a severe pyogranulomatous lymphadenitis as a result of infection by mutated feline coronavirus. The name of the disease is feline infectious peritonitis. This is the dry form, which is characterized by inflammation of vessels in which the primary component generally includes macrophages. The mutated virus, when it gains the ability to live within macrophages, becomes 
feline infectious peritonitis. And as part of the re reproductive process, we'll activate these macrophages, which in turn causes local proliferation. It's in the best interest of this virus. Finally, as we close this lecture, a very large lymph node from a dog, diffuse granulomus lymphadenitis. I have to mention the dimorphic fungi in dogs and cats. They are ubiquitous, although uh, some affect the entire world, like cryptococcosis. Some are more specific to North and Central, and even parts of South America, which would include histoplasma, blastomyces, and various species of coccidiomycosis. Very characteristically cause granulomas to pyogranulomas lesions, not only in lymph nodes, but in late infections in the viscera of affected animals. Well, that's a brief review of lymphadenitis and reactive hyperplasia. I hope you've enjoyed the lecture. Lecture three will cover lymphoid neoplasia. Thanks for your attention.